Hi. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I'm just really relieved to see that there's a bunch of advanced sitters here today um, because, because that means I can go deep. I'm telling you, all week I have been struggling saying, how do I convey what I need to convey today and say it in a linear manner, right? Because um, this idea of working in consciousness and expanding over the years, and I'm like, how, how, how do I do this? How, how, do I say, how do I say what I need to say? And it's so exciting that basically everybody in the room, you've all been sitting for a long time. So this is cool. I can really kind of say what I need to say. <laughs> so, um, so I just want to say that the reason why I came up with the talk today was because, you know, I've been doing the Peace Project now for a while, and I've been working with Intention for a while. And you can imagine that if you end up doing a Peace Project in Intention, that maybe the universe would put you through your paces on Intention, right? Like, like at this point, yeah, after all these years of studying and uh, working with these concepts, that the universe is kind of like, just definitely has taught me many, many things. And one of the things that, so you can imagine that at this point I'm getting pretty granular with it, meaning that um, in very, very deep places and in, in, in intention and what is it and why is it. So today the title of the talk was Why Use Intention. And that was actually not just because I came up with the title of the talk, but really was because, you know, not too long ago, I was like really why, why use intention. I was really asking the question, even though I've been working with it for years. And um, because it was interesting, because there was something in the Peace Project that wasn't quite working, and I remember saying, somebody saying to me, well, you know, have you done an intention on it? And actually at that moment, with the person saying that to me, my stomach just turned. Because not only had I done an intention on it, you know, I had done the intention a gazillion times on it, right? And so the idea of like doing another intention just actually turned my stomach, and I was like, okay, what, what, you know, and, and I remember leaving there going, feeling like, like I had a pebble in my shoe, meaning like something was irritating me. So that meant that I definitely needed to go home and work on it. And so I started to have my conversations with spirit, as I often do in my kitchen, and they can sometimes be a little, you know, vociferous. And um, so I was like really s sitting there in my kitchen, like as usual, like, spirit, really? Like, I'm supposed to do an intention on this again. Like, are you serious? You know, kind of like when you've been telling your kids the same thing for, right, anyone here have kids, right? And you tell your kids the same thing over and over again, and you're like, really, do I need to say this again? You know, that kind of feeling. And so having this, this feeling with spirit of like, have we not gone over this? You know, like, have, have I not, you know, what, what? So then what happened was the very short answer that I got was yes. That even though I, I, I live, I, I, that I live with the Peace Project 24-7, 365. Um, actually, I'm going to say 22-7, 365. Meaning that at the time I was saying, do I really need to spend my meditation time on the Peace Project? Like seriously? If I'm living something 22-7, 365, saying I meditate about two hours a day. Like seriously, like you want my meditation too. Like really, that should be the time that I should get a break, right? That should be the time. A break. Don't you think? Exactly. So I was kind of seeing. So and the and the and the question that came back, technically, and the short answer is yes, but the answer came in from a very different kind of angle. Because what has struck me about intention at this point is intention, or the idea of sitting in prayer, sitting in intention, is the idea that it's not about the intention. It's about that when we sit and we, we sit in intention, we sit in prayer, what we do is remind ourselves who, are, who we are. It's this idea of taking your seat in the infinite. It's the idea that, yes, I am called many times a day to calibrate to that who I am in the internal world. And so the idea that, and then it all my intentions kind of took a totally different edge at that point. It was this idea of like, oh, I couldn't wait to go sit in intention. And so, but the funny thing was is that the intention really isn't everything that we're taught in intentioning school, right? Um, so meaning that what I'm talking about is kind of like the behind the intention and understanding the fact that this is our time to kind of commune with the infinite and that our intentions are really something that we lay at the feet of the infinite. So you know if you study Dr. Joe's work, now Lemme Taggart's added uh, the, la the level of it to surrender. Right? This idea that you set the intention and you, and you make it all clear and everything and then you surrender it. But we don't really think about, well, what, what are we surrendering it to? And it always seems like, okay, well, I've sent the intention, now I surrender it. And then it's like, now what? 
But what if you send the intention and the now what is you remember that you're part of the infinite and you remember that you're part of the sea of things of, of communication. Now I'm going to go back now and kind of make that more real as opposed to kind of making this, this vague statement about remembering. Um, and that's why I'm really glad that there's advanced sitters here <laughs> because I can talk I can talk very deep at this point. Um, so so uh, has anyone here read Aben Alexander's book Proof of Heaven? Okay, yeah. Do you, Suzanne, do, what do you remember about the book that you particularly liked? Or what was one of your takeaways from it? The, um, <coughs> the, the vastness, the, 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 the inner space that is all light, all dark, all open, all closed. Um, it's a place that, that I've been, and, and the description was profound. Right, right. So let me back up, because I realize that most of you, if you haven't read the book, A Proof of Heaven, um, it's by Aben Alexander, who was who's a neurosurgeon who actually trained um, taught at Harvard for 15 years, um, and what happened was he ended up um, getting meningitis and he went into a coma for seven days. So while his neocortex was kind of offline, um, he had a near death experience that lasted a very long time, and um, when he came back, he's pretty he's the only person in the planet who's ever survived that type of of infection. And um, he said, uh, being a neurosurgeon himself, he was saying if someone had had the, neuro had the infection for 48 hours, he wouldn't have expected the person to come back with any, any faculties left. They would have been a vegetable. And yet he was out for seven days, and not only did he came back, he was actually working pretty soon after that. So when he's on the other side, this is what Suzanne is talking about, right? That he was talking about what happened when he was on the other side, right? This vastness, and you said that you've been there. <coughs> Yeah, so tell, talk more about this vastness that you were, and, and why it's so profound to you, and why it's, you, it's so real. I saw your ears almost tear there for a minute, right? Because it's that real, right? Can you talk about that? Yeah, to, right? I, I can. It's beauty, yeah. <laughs> it's just beauty, isn't it? Um, yeah, I've, I don't know how much information you want. Right. I, um, it's been meaningful to you? Well, my, my son took his life about six years ago. Okay. And I discovered that if if you listen, if you're a receiver, um, there's communication. Yeah. And so I had a lot of communication and I started writing it down and I have a, a book that's too big, I've got to make it smaller. But I I learned I learned how to travel with my son in, into the next realm. And I mean, it, I don't know as I learned, I just, I just, he just came in and took me there. And then through Mark's music a few weeks ago, I actually had a, a vision of how to, how to go myself right, instead right. of just waiting. Right. Oh, beautiful. Sweet. Suzanne, I'm so happy you're here because that's what I want to talk about today. Awesome. <laughs> it's like, why wait? <laughs> right? Let's go there now. I know, exactly. <laughs> exactly. This well, idea of why wait because it's real, isn't it? Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Can I just say something that kind of tags off of this when you asked about the book and what the yeah. vision that we saw? What stood out for me the other day during a meditation was when he was flying on the wing of a butterfly through the universe. Yeah. And I was flying through the universe on the wing of a butterfly, and it was like so yeah. cool. And I can't really put words around it, but it's similar to what you're saying. <coughs> and what I experienced is like, I can do this anytime. Right. You know? Right. You know, one, one thing that I think makes it difficult, at least what, what I've, was, I only speak for myself, but. That's um, <laughs> I, when I started describing it, I realized that it's all opposites. 
And if you're okay with that, just go with that. And you can just you describe it even though it was completely vast and scary and completely close and comforting. It was completely color and completely nothing. It was movement but nothing to measure movement by. Mm -hmm. Right, right. The right. <laughs> numinous, right? Just go ahead and look <laughs> the opposite. So. Right. But there's this profound uh, feeling of knowingness, of, of knowing that you've touched something very profound, right? And so this idea of, um, and so getting the idea that when we're sitting down to intention and the idea that, um, so, so the Course in Miracles basically tells us that the purpose of prayer is for us to kind of remind us who we are, okay? It's to truly forget the things that we think we need. And anything here in this realm, we start to realize when you have an experience like that, the things in this realm kind of seem a little pulse, right? Little what? what what's your word? Um, when you come back from that experience and you come back here, it's kind of like... I don't, I don't know. I, I'm, it's not that they're, it's not that they're unimportant. Right, right. Um, but they're a lot smaller, a lot less to be worried about. Yeah. So a shift in perspective. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of times we, we're living our lives in an NLP sense, like, the stuff that bothers us is big and bright and close. And then when we have these other experiences, all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, it's it's not that big a deal. It's still important, and yet it's not quite the right. The, the, the definition thing we thought of about. things start to change. Yes. What do you mean by that? Um. I'm really put. I'm really putting you on the spot. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Just came to show up. There will be a test. I know. I know. I'm sorry. I really don't mean to. But that's actually good because I, I'm liking this a lot. I hope you guys are too. And, and just let us know if it's too much. Yeah. To exactly. I don't mean I feel like to I'm be. On the talk show. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um. Okay. So. Well, I'll I'll just go with the loss, the loss of my son. Is the definition of that in this in this realm is this in, incredible loss? It, it's this unbelievable amount of pain. But when you experience the next realm or another realm. Right. It's like I always get this when I when I say things like, You shouldn't have done this. Why did you leave me? I get this really? Really? You you think I'm gone? You think I'm gone? You know, so it change it changes how I think about Life and death. Everything, right? Everything. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And um, like worrying about a job. You know? Right. Right. Um, it's like, well, how important is a job? What? What if there's a different job? What if there's, you know, it's like you start. I, I start seeing things <coughs> from here, and right. so. Like the definition of worry changes to instead of worry more like bothersome. It takes us it takes like a step down. Right, right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm gonna have to think about so, that because I, I haven't, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but and it's it's this idea of what, you know, Jesus used to say in the Bible of, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all else will be added unto you that you really get it, that there is this place within you that when you tap into it, it is so profound that this world starts to look very differently. It's kind of like when you look at, like, it's when you, you see those movie sets, right? And you see a movie set and it looks like it's a city street, but then the camera pulls back and you realize that the buildings are really just vertical walls and there's like nothing there, right? 
and you start to kind of see this whole world from this this kind of like their vertical walls like you're starting to get it that that beautiful place is where you want to live and be in at all times right i, I can see the right because it's that profound right and so what what's been happening a lot with a lot of the people that i know that are meditating and doing dr joe's work or whatever is that we're actually stumbling over to the other side and that it's really not as far as we think because think about it, when you transition, that portion of you that's eternal is here now, okay? There's that line in The Course of Miracles where Jesus basically says, you know, you and I are basically the same, that's Jesus talking, you and I are basically the same, the only thing different is you have stuff I don't. Meaning that we've got stuff layered on top of our eternal nature, right? So the idea is when, you start, when we start diving into our sense of being, this deep place within ourselves, and we start getting underneath what I used to call the peace underneath, or getting, getting underneath the chatter, then you start to tip into being. And then, then you kind of start getting that that is like the place to be. And this world starts to shift in how much we're so drawn to it and not getting, and, and starting to get to the point where the more you go down and dive into it, the more you just want to hang out there, and the more you start realizing that the veil between this side and the other side is actually right here all the time. It's, it's hard to go back and forth. I, yes. I started having a really hard time, and I realized that I, I, I'm actually living in, in this world. Yeah. And I, I need to live in this world. I was... I really felt like yeah, yeah. I was not somewhere that I shouldn't be, but somewhere that I couldn't stay. Right, right, right. So, so the idea is that, so what if, what if we were to spend a portion of our lives to start kind of practicing this idea of being between back and forth a little bit, right? See, um, the Buddha said, you know, enlightenment is progressive disillusionment. Basically that this world has to fail us before we're willing to trade up. Mm -hmm. And what happens in the second half of life is that we have all these losses, right? We built up things in life and things didn't quite work out the way we wanted. And so like we have to shore up these kind of losses or whatever. And it can, you can spend the, spend the second half of life kind of like being, feeling really miserable. Or what if it's all a setup so that we actually fall up? We actually fall toward we actually fall into this beautiful, beautiful space. And then this whole world starts to shift as far as how we carry it. And you carry it lightly. And yet, and the more you do that, the more appreciation just kind of sneaks up on you. And the more you just start to realize that everything is actually very, anyways, you just start to gain this deep, deep appreciation for where you are and where you're going. And you're knowing that, that the other side is right there and it starts to change how we live. Mm -hmm. So just to add to some of this, so it doesn't just sound so out there, um, uh, in Avon Alexander's last book, The Mindful Universe, he talks about this idea that when brain waves go down, basically our awareness of the other side goes up. Okay? So what if the next time you, when we go into meditation, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to relax my shoulders and, what, and just go within. I'm going to go in and seek to set an intention to to merge with that portion of myself that is deeply connected to myself and to the rest of the world. Um, I love that the, David Bohm, who was a, a theoretical physicist, he talks about how deep within us is this nexus that when we go deep within ourselves, we actually get connected to all there is. Okay, and so the more that we're training to go into these deep places, and Dr. Joe's work is so profound in that, and ha taking us into the void and taking us into that empty space, but the idea of <clears throat> of um, kind of lifting ourselves up at the same time, <clears throat> shedding this world. I'll give you an example. A couple, uh, a while ago, I, I'm highly skilled in, in all this mental work, and I was in a, seri a, pain, a serious time of pain. And I was in, it was emotional pain, and I was working with this pain, and I was just determined that this night was not going to be, I was going to deal with the emotional pain. And it was, it was one of the, it was related to the most traumatic incident that's happened in my life. And so basically what happened was I spent the night in my mind knowing that pain is, temp is, is a place in the body and knowing that if I relax it, um, the pain will go away. 
So all night long, I'm being disciplined. I'm just taking my mind. I'm looping around the body. 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 And and after and I I played music and I just kept looping. And after a while, I could just all of a sudden feel myself start to lift. And then all of a sudden, I just got taken to the other side. And I remember when I started to lift, I was like, "See you, bye." <laughs> you know. And I was just kind of like, wow, that pain that was so excruciating, that absolute physical pain that was in the body was so bad. And to actually use that pain to pivot off of it to go into who we are. And what if we didn't just walk around kind of being so tolerant of the pain, the problems, this and that, but what if we used it to actually propel us into these states, these enlightened states, these more buoyant states? And then what happens is you start chirping into a state space and you know that wholeness is with you all the time. It's like when I work with people in their meditation and they don't want to come out of meditation, I'll say to them, you don't want to come out because you're in your wholeness. That's the place of your being where you want nothing. Like that's, that's who you are right there. That's it. Okay. So, and what if we practice to be able to hold our field like this for longer and longer periods of time? So that's what we're going to do in the meditation a little bit. And so I've been kind of playing with the idea of like, how do I teach this? How do I, how do I work with this? So bottom line is if you were to take all spirituality and distill it down, it comes down to really a binary set. Okay, it doesn't matter where you go, who you learn from, you know, I've been to John Agat in Brazil, Peru, different, you know, John, uh, Dr. Joe, it doesn't matter. The bottom line, all spirituality boils down to, to a binary set. And, th and that's this. In life, you're either going to expand or contract. That's it. That's it. Could you expand on that? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, basically, something comes down the road, are you going to expand or contract? You know, something lousy happens, you're going to expand or contract. Something good happens, you're going to expand or contract, right? So, like, what are you going to do? So the whole discipline of all of this is expanding our fields, expanding our awareness. And when we expand our fields, um, then that's when we're starting to actually feel heaven around us. That the more we widen our perceptual field, the more we become aware of the space around us, the more that we are aware of our energy field, that's when you're starting to actually feel nourished by the field around you. Okay, so so in the in the meditation that we're going to do, that's one of the things that we're going to practice is this idea of um, uh, becoming aware of the space around us. And I'm sending these around because this is a picture of the toroidal field, the, the field around the body that scientists have shown. If you could take one and pass it on, so I want you to have that visual of what your field should look like, or energetically. Field is decent and healthy, and again, we all have our challenges with our field, but theoretically, that's kind of how our field should feel. And there are going to be awareness when you bring your awareness around your field. You're going to notice some parts of your field might be a little concave, something might feel a little, um, you know, more linear and less curvature. It doesn't matter. Just become aware of ideally what the field, the shape of the field should be, and we're going to work on expanding our awareness out to to open that field. There's another thing that I want to show you is that um, <laughs> there's another thing I want to show you, and I'm going to send this around as well, um, and that is that this is a, a picture from Barbara Brennan's book, Light Emerging, and what this is is something called what's called the line of intention, and the line of intention, basically there's three ass points on it, the point below the lower belly, the heart, and above the head. In the meditation as well, what I'm going to have you do a little bit is work a little bit with the line of intention. The line of intention is actually quite interesting because when we're on that line, this ideally this is the Godhead up here above the head. And when we point our consciousness up into the Godhead, very often you will feel it. You'll feel a, tangi a tangible um, sensation. Um, energy will often come down. I've had clients on the table even say to me they thought I was anointing their head with oil um, because it's that tangible when it starts to kind of come down. It can be. Um, so in the meditation, another thing I'm going to do is just work a little bit with this line of intention. I just want to pass that around, okay? So, <laughs> so um, and I want to finish up some ideas here because, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say, like, how do I, how do I lead you, how do, I, how, do I, how do we all have this experience together? 
And so, and, the, and yet this is kind of what I've been training in, training in, training in, training in, is opening the field, opening the field, opening the field. And I will tell you that it is, it, it is so, it's, it's so beautiful. It's getting so sublime. And you're starting to recognize that we're all getting there, um, that many people are getting there. Uh, and can you talk about your experience at Dr. Joe? Because um, after we did a four-hour meditation opening the pineal gland, Anne had an experience. Actually, it was the first meditation. Um, oh, it was? It was the first meditation I was there, and, and we were in Cancun, Bethany and I, and I had been to the progressive workshop with Dr. Joe and went to the advanced in Cancun and really had no idea what to expect. Um, and as he's explaining what the course of the meditations was going to be throughout the course of the week and that the last meditation was going to be four hours, I was about ready to pack my bag and go home. <laughs> um, because I enjoy meditation, but that degree of it I wasn't sure I was ready for, but... Um, what really changed my mind was the first meditation that we had, and I've done Dr. Joe's meditations, and I've worked with Bethany on meditations, but boy, I was, I was in kindergarten with the group of people that were there, and I felt that, that I was very new and raw. Um, but the great thing was, because of my work with Bethany, I was able to just really let myself go, and I really value what you had said earlier, Suzanne, about you know how vast and how, 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 how vast it was, and yet how close it was, because um, I felt very similar reactions when it started for me. And, but it happened very quickly, and I went, the next thing I knew, I had no body, I had no existence, it was just, I was somewhere I had never been before. And it was really pretty incredible, and as I'm going through it, I realized I was afraid to not be afraid. Um, I was, um, if that makes any sense, because I've lived so much of my <coughs> life in fear, and to let that go, I didn't know what that, I, I, didn't, know how, I didn't know what to do with it. Because I, you live your life in fear and you're, you're just in this rut and you're stuck in the muck and the mire. And to not have that, to all of a sudden see something on the other side and it's not there. There is no fear. There's nothing to be afraid of. I was afraid to go there. And it took me, I resisted it in the beginning. And then I just, I just kept hearing Bethany's words, just let it go, just let it go, let you, just let it go. And, you know, and Dr. Joe was doing this amazing job with the meditation. And the next thing you know, I just let it go. And I was somewhere like I said I had never been before I had no body left and within a matter of <coughs> very short period of time I was in the presence of God and I knew I was in the presence of God and I didn't it's not like I saw angels wings or anything you know it wasn't a power some of my friends have said well you know it's all the power of suggestion I'm like no no no, uh, you, need, you need to get it I, it's just it's something it wasn't anything that I had projected it was just something that was there and as I'm, as I'm watching what I knew was myself in this realm of the unified field, whatever it is you want to call it, I knew God was there. And with that, um, I also had lost several, my mom, my dad, and my brother in a very short period of time, and they were there. And it was, it was very similar, like, wait, you think you're getting rid of us? You know, we're here. We're in your heart. We're in your... <laughs> no, wait, you're not getting rid of us. That We're going to continue to pester you, and luckily they have. And, um, and I forget that on certain times. I forget how powerful that was, and I allow myself to go back into that muck, which is why I come as often as I possibly can and work with the Peace Project, because it, it brings me back, and your music brings me back. And it says that this is the place that you want to live your life, in this expanded place of where day-to-day -day stuff, but it's still a struggle for me. I'm afraid to not be afraid, and I thought of that this morning as I was, you know, thinking about reading the thing about coming today. I'm afraid to not be afraid because that's what I'm used to. But when I can get myself past that, it's just it's an incredible way to live. Is it can really I? well articulated. Thank you. Yeah. Can I share one thing? Um, what I, this thing that I, that I um, saw when I was listening to Mark a month or so ago, was the the muck. It was muck, and it was, and and I I really hate to say this about a pond or a lake because all that muck is good stuff. But but that's the way I was visualizing it. That it was, that I was kind of stuck in this in this thick pond, and and I was told to get on top of it. Get on top. And. And I was like, okay, well, how do I stay on top? But it was like, make it ice. It's like, oh. So now I'm on, now I'm on top. And and then I started, I just started skating, and and I I saw myself just sort of skate and then keep that motion going, but leave the ice. And I just went, I just went up on my own, and 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 out. 
and that's the that was the first time I used to just wait. Right. I just you know I used to just wait for, you know the the times that I've had like that have been with my son, and I would just wait for him to come and mm. and and take me, and I would I would wonder, shouldn't you be afraid? Mm. Look at where you are. You you don't know where you are. You don't know how you're going to get back. Yeah. You'd be Absolutely. afraid, but I wasn't. It doesn't I wasn't matter. afraid, but the, st I still had that conflict with. Shouldn't you be afraid? So and so in those places, what a good thing to do is yet yeah, like you were saying, let it go and lay it down, because the idea yeah. is that you lay you lay that down so that you can commune with God more. So it's kind of like this idea of like, take this from me. All this is doing is blocking my communication with you. Please take this from me, right? So um, I just want to go over some of these things from the Course in Miracles because it, it's going to help kind of see <coughs> it from different angles. Um, um, so, okay, let's go down to the third one, uh, the third bullet. Uh, prayer is a stepping aside, a letting go, a quiet time of listening and loving. It should not be so confused with supplication of any kind because it's a way of remembering your holiness. Why would holiness entreat being fully entitled to everything love has to offer? And it is love to go into prayer. Prayer is an offering, a giving up of yourself to be with love. There is nothing to ask because there is nothing left to want. So the idea is all this intentioning work we've been doing, it's really good stuff, it's really good stuff, but there's that place of like, you know what, take this because it's really, I want to be in that love. Okay, so especially if you feel like you've been intentioned, this so it's it revitalized my intentioning because it was kind of like I am so bored with intentioning. I don't want to like I'm just I'm done I'm I'm bored with a lot of things I'm bored with Christmas I'm bored with like I'm bored a lot with this world I've never been too enamored or drank the Kool Aid too here too much, but um but like I'm you know so the idea that I can kind of I can remember my eternal nature and that I can fall into love. And just be in love and be in being. It's just, it's re been revolutionizing me. Um, so there's another thing, um, okay, down here. And, and, and this idea that, and of course it's very clear that we can't be in both places at the same time. That if you try to have a foot in this world and you try to have a foot, like basically you're trying to do results and you're, you're really, you're attached to the, to the third dimension and you're attached to the other dimension. It's like you can't really be in both, okay? The idea that um, you're either going to, you're gonna are you, are you gonna be in the on the love side or you want to be in the third dimension third dimension is not a bad choice it's just do you want to be in pain or not you know like and you, after a while I'm often encouraging people to become intolerant of pain become intolerant of feeling miserable we've gotten far too used to marinating ourselves in misery chemicals all the time okay it's almost an addiction you know like my name was talking about she was afraid to not feel fear like that's that's an addiction. We, you know, we don't know anything else. Right, right, <laughs> right. Like, oh. So we're going to yeah. practice today about where to let go of those things because um, it's all in our field. Um, so when it says here, you um, uh, yet you um, it says here, the, here when you have seen the real world as you will surely do, you will remember us. Yet you must learn the cost of sleeping and refuse to pay it. Only then will you decide to awaken. And then the real world will spring to your sight, for Christ has never slept. He has been waiting to be seen, for he has never lost sight of you. He looks quietly in the real world, which, which he would share with you, because he knows, you know, this is all in the language of that, um, Father's love for you. And knowing this, he would give you what is yours. Um, so, and then down there it says, the world that you see must be denied, for sight of it is costing you a different kind of vision. You cannot see both worlds, for each of them involves a different type of seeing and depends on what you cherish. But sight of one is possible because you have denied the other. Both are not true, yet one will seem real to you as, as, um, to the amount that you hold it dear. So the idea that, um, the idea that you know, life happens and it, the second half of life you know, um, is, is different, right? And the idea is you know, what can happen is we can actually use it to catapult into these new spaces. If we, no, one, recognize they're there, know that they're available. Um, and what the research has shown is, like I said, when our brainwaves go down, this awareness of this other world goes up. All right? So um, this idea of maybe doing meditation with an intention of where you're going. You're going into love. Right? Um, and anything that would make you feel not love, we want to surrender down. Right? 
So um, any thoughts or anything before we um, go, if I could just say one other thing. I love it also where, this is interesting where it's basically saying we experience it, but then we go back into the third dimension. So he says, um, and then step back into darkness, not because you think it's real. Basically step back into the third dimension, not because you think it's real, but only to proclaim its unreality in terms which still have meaning. Um, basically so it's saying... Is this the third dimension? Yeah. Okay, so... What we, yeah. What we're experiencing here are the three dimensions. Yeah. Okay. And so the more we start to kind of um, get that this other world is very real and, and, and honor it, then when we walk out into the third dimension, it's a different experience. So does anyone have any thoughts about this before we kind of go into meditation? What are your thoughts? Anyone have a particular good skill that makes you go deep? Go ahead. No, I just wanted to ask you that last sentence you said. So, so we go to this other place to gather this knowledge and awareness, mm -hmm. but then we come back to the third dimension to help others. Pretty much, yeah, space. and I, I like, I like uh, Ken Wilbert says, you know, the minute you realize that we're, basically the idea that you go to the other side and then you come back and you're like refreshed and you're like ready to kind of take anything here, but you put it in your perspective. You see that it's, it's just a, a, a studio set of a street. Mm. It's not the real deal. Right, and also aren't we like desiring, and isn't it almost like almost like a, a duty? I don't know that that's the right word right. to show others how to get to the other side. Now, I, I think if you're called to it, I think I think if you're called to it, I like the line in the course where Jesus basically says, you know, don't trust your good intentions. Like check oh, with me before oh you God. think something is good. You know yeah. what I mean? So, um, and I do believe that's the bodhisattva, is that they know they can leave at any time, but they turn on their heel and they come back to help humanity, right? So, um, you know, I always kind of say after a certain point, there's two options for people, either being or teaching. Other than that, like, when you reach a certain level, it's kind of like you're either a bodhisattva <laughs> or you're in, in being kind of thing. Um, so, so, um, so anyway, so... Um, yeah, I mean, ideally, they, I've also been re reading, I've known about him for a while, there's a guy named Swedenborg, anyone know Swedenborg? He was a okay. Swed so Swedish mystic, <laughs> he was a Swedish mystic who actually kind of had a near-death experience for 29 years. <laughs> um, he was in the, <laughs> I know, isn't that funny? Um, but he was living between the worlds for 29 years, and he was what they call a universal genius, he was a brilliant everything from, you know, scientists, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and so, um, uh, what what was the question that you just said? Because I brought up Swedenborg for a reason. It, it's almost incumbent upon us to teach others. How oh, to I know. Others. Because this this really, I like this. Because this is the way I kind of feel like I live a lot. And that is, he's like, the, the idea of feeling useful. He was like basically saying, heaven is right here all the time. It's always right the realm right here. And our job is to sense it and to feel it and to be it. Um, and then to be useful to the heavens. To be useful. To kind of give, to feel, give away your call. And I think I've, if you ever feel energy, whatever, I've really come to understand that that is the other, that is heaven. If you feel energy and you feel things moving around, that's heaven talking to you. And I've learned that if you magnify that feeling, if you magnify your good feelings and you follow them out, they literally take you up to heaven. It's like pulling a, pulling a thread and you end up like in the other side. If you, if you were disciplined enough to hold your mind there, surrender your body enough, it's like reliable, repeatable if you if you do that. So understand like that's how close heaven is. It's like closer to us than our breath. Um, so we're gonna practice today, and this is pretty much the same thing. This pretty much any time I teach, it's always the same meditation. Um, but understand, but if we do it from a different uh, this understanding now that if heaven is right here, and all of this spirituality distills down to are we con gonna contract or expand? Then we're going to take our minds, we're going to find a place in our body where our field is contracted and pulled in, and we're going to learn how to stretch it out and to hold it, okay? So the idea that, um, so because what happens is anything in the third dimension scares us, we pull in, and we're going to hold it. We're going to, lately I've been listening to a Christian song that talks about taking, taking a walk like a lion or taking a stand. I want you to be able to kind of like take a stand in your energy field which is for that which you know is good and right and true. And something that's scary and something that, you know, whatever is in your life that's scary, we're going to scan your field, find out where you contract, pull it, and, and pull it, and we're going to hold it open and just honor it and to stretch it out and to expand and feel the gorgeousness of that because that's when you trip into your eternal nature. 
So, um, all right. So, are we, do we want to turn the lights out a little bit? 